Hello everyone and welcome to today's WorkSafe Tasmania Month webinar, Building Better Safe sorry, better safe building a high trust culture in the workplace. I'm Stephanie Murawski from WorkSafe Tasmania, your moderator for today's webinar. Before we start, we ask that you take a moment to read the following slide about information received today. I'll now run through how you can participate in today's webinar. Please use the questions window on your control panel to type and submit questions at any time during the presentation. Questions will be addressed by the presenters at the end of today's webinar. Only presenter webcams will be used today. And then finally, today's webinar is being recorded. I would now like to introduce your presenters, Dr. Kieran Holm and Valerie Matsumoto. Dr. Holm is a psychologist and presenter. Valerie is an innovation and service coordinator. Both are from Positive Solutions. Kieran provides counselling to workers referred through employee assistance programs. Valerie leads and facilitates mediation and employee assistance program services. Welcome Kieran and Valerie. Thanks so much Stephanie. It's thank really you. nice to be here and thanks so much to everyone who's watching. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I'll just start by telling you a little bit about us to begin with. Um, so Positive Solutions is a Tasmanian not-for-profit organisation that was established uh, 30 years ago. Uh, we offer a range of services in uh, the mediation and counselling space, and we have a range of uh, workplace services. Um, so for instance, uh, like Stephanie mentioned just before, um, the employee assistance program, uh, but, but we also offer workplace support, training, supervision, uh, critical incidents, management, um, conflict coaching, and workplace mediation. So today we'll be discussing some of the ways we can develop positive workspaces in order to reduce the risk of harm to employees' wellbeing. Um, we'll be discussing um, how we can identify potential hazards um, in the workplace, so in particular risks to the psychological safety of workers. Um, we'll look at examining how these hazards can harm uh, people's wellbeing as well as some of the costs of these hazards to organisations. Um, and we'll take a look at the how and why of investing in structural and cultural change in workplaces. Um, and we'll also discuss how values of compassion, uh, curiosity and creativity can be implemented in the workplace um, in order to lead a transformation of workplace culture. So organisations are required to provide a safe work environment for all staff. And according to current legislation, organisations have a duty of care to ensure the health and the safety of workers. Um, and this means that an organisation is required to identify hazards and take reasonable steps to minimise and eliminate those hazards. Um, so psychosocial hazards can arise from a range of different factors. Um, there's organisational factors, environmental and individual factors. And this webinar will really be focusing on um, I guess more of the organisational factors that relate to workplace culture. Um, so it's really common for us to think about uh, mainly of physical dangers when we think of um, work health and safety, but I guess it's also really important to, to kind of consider um, those parts of our work that can cause harm to our mental health and wellbeing. Um, and these, um, these are really called psychosocial hazards. So generally the longer that someone's exposed to um, a psychosocial hazard, the greater the chances of harm. So a really good example of this would be um, if somebody's exposed to workplace bullying or harassment. Um, but it's also important to recognise that um, there, there can be short-term psychosocial hazards as well. So these can be things that um, kind of happen as a, a one-off event. Um, so it might be that there's a critical work, workplace incident that can really impact um, staff wellbeing. Um, so on this slide, you can see some of the examples of some of the more common um, psychosocial hazards. Um, so we're looking at things here like um, the, the job demand, um, the clarity of the role, um, if there's conflict in the workplace. Um, some other examples are, are things like um, fatigue from, from the work that we do. It might be that we're not really involved in decision making um, in our workplace. Um, it might be that we're experiencing lower levels of support from, from management. Um, and like I mentioned before, um, some other issues that, that can be um, seen as psychosocial hazards are things like critical workplace incidents bullying harassment. Um, and another issue, um, which I think is quite quite a current one, is that idea of um, a lot of people now working remotely as well, and the, the um, challenges that can present us with. Sorry. 
the next one. Um, so like physical hazards, psychosocial hazards can negatively impact um, employees and organisations. Um, so this slide shows some of the ways that um, psychosocial hazards can, can have that impact. Um, so if employees are exposed to psychosocial hazards, they're at greater levels, uh, sorry, greater risk of high levels of stress. Um, and they're also at increased risk of psychological injury, which um, is uh, sort of refers to a diagnosable mental health disorder that is influenced by work-related factors. Um, so for organisations, um, there's a range of um, impacts um, that can be experienced. Um, so that these are things like loss of productivity, um, there can be higher staff turnover, um, and also an increase in workers' compensation claims. Um, and psychosocial hazards can also lead to um, issues such as absenteeism and, and presenteeism. Um, I'll just explain a little bit about what those two terms mean. Um, so absenteeism is, um, is really um, that idea of absence. So when employees are not present at work due to mental health condition um, and the employer is paying the person for not presenting to work. Um, and presenteeism is a little bit different. So that's when a person presents to work um, like the name suggests, but they're um, actually less productive in their role due to their mental health condition. So mental health issues are common in the workplace. Um, according to the Australian Bureau of Statistics, 45% of Australians are estimated to experience a mental health condition during their lifetime. Um, one in five workers are actually estimated to currently experience a mental health condition. Um, some of the common, the most common mental health conditions in Australia are anxiety and depression, which tend to occur during a person's working years. Um, and really interestingly, the rates of mental health conditions in employees actually varies according to industry. Uh, this slide shows um, some estimations across the industries of the incidence of mental health conditions in Australia. Um, and I think it's really important to mention that there's uh, psychosocial hazards that are specific to certain industries. So for example, in some industries, jobs um, can be more isolating than others. Um, in the transport industry, for example, drivers may be geographically dispersed. Um, and some, some work that we might do, such as in the retail industry, can have a lot of um, pressure that's specific to that role. So it might be work targets that are really difficult to achieve for the staff. Um, and in some industries, um, such as in legal and healthcare settings, uh, workers are more at risk of developing um, vicarious trauma um, through um, being repeatedly exposed to traumatic material. Um, if you're interested, please feel free to share some of your ideas in the chat feature uh, with Stephanie about um, other psychosocial hazards that, that you might um, consider would relate to certain industries. Um, and also please feel free to share any thoughts you have on why some of the industries that we've listed on this slide um, might actually have a high estimation um, of mental health conditions in, in those industries. We're really interested to, um, to hear your thoughts. Um, so why focus on improving mental wellbeing in the workplace? Um, we can answer this question by considering the idea of return on investment, um, which is a term that really refers to the financial benefits of an organisation's investment in that particular service. Organisations can gain significant financial benefits when they take action to develop a mentally healthy workplace. Um, there's actually been some Australian research that suggests that organisations gain um, quite a bit actually from creating mentally healthy workplaces. So an average of $2.30 in benefits for every dollar that it's spent, um, which I thought was um, a pretty amazing finding. Um, some of the financial benefits of creating mentally healthy workplaces, as you might expect, are things like reduced absenteeism, um, reduction in presenteeism, and also um, a reduction in workers' compensation claims. Um, I wanted to mention there's a really useful online tool at headsup.org.au, which we'll provide a link to at the end of the webinar. Um, and that can be used to actually calculate the estimated return on investment for an organisation that invests in developing a mentally healthy workplace. Um, so it's called the Heads Up ROI tool, and it's um, really user friendly. You can select an in industry and size of an organisation, and then it provides you with the estimated financial costs um, to the organisation um, due to absenteeism, presenteeism, and, and compensation claims. Um, and it also provides the expected financial benefits to the organisation. Um, if the organisation were to invest in creating a mentally healthy workplace. So I'm going to talk briefly about a model called the Smart Work Design Model, um, which was developed by Professor Sharon Parker at the Centre for Tran Transformative Work Design. So this model contains five key characteristics that relate to psychosocial aspects of risk um, and can be used as a way for us to kind of, I guess, consider how we can reduce psychosocial hazards in the workplace. Um, and to think a little bit about our own, I guess, personal values um, in the workplace as well. 
Um, so the five work characteristics according to this model are stimulating, mastery, agency, relational and tolerable. So stimulating is really referring to when employees have variation in the tasks that they perform, as well as when they have interesting and meaningful tasks. Uh, mastery refers to the knowledge that employees have of their role and their understanding of how they're, they're going about um, performing their role. Uh, agency is really about the control that employees have um, of their role and um, oh, sorry, the control employees have over their tasks and includes having a say over work-related decisions. And um, relational is uh, referring to the importance of connection and support in the workplace. So it might be uh, looking at things like getting along with our, our peers, um, receiving support from supervisors. And tolerable refers to having reasonable demands um, at work that employees can manage and are not too overwhelming for them. Um, so in today's webinar, we'll be focusing on how curiosity, compassion and creativity can be developed in the workplace. Um, and this means we'll be kind of focusing specifically uh, more on these two characteristics of the SMART model, which are stimulating and relational. So many of the characteristics identified by the SMART work design model on the previous slide um, can be related to workplace culture. Culture of an organisation is, is really the written and unwritten rules of an organisation. The norms, values and behaviours that the employees share and demonstrate. A positive work culture helps employees thrive and can actually really shape the reputation that an organisation has. Um, developing a safe and healthy work culture has been found to significantly reduce psychosocial hazards in the workplace. We can use survey tools to get a sense of the culture of an organisation and staff wellbeing and perceptions. Um, and one example of such a tool is the Thrive at Work survey tool. Um, and this, this tool is a reliable and validated assessment measure um, developed by organisational psychologists. And it can be used to get an understanding of staff perceptions and also to identify um, psychosocial hazards, um, some of those things we were talking about earlier. Um, you can access some information about the tool at the Thrive at Work website and we'll also provide the URL at the end of the webinar. So now I'll introduce you to Valerie, um, who will be speaking with you a little bit about the values of compassion, curiosity and creativity in the workplace. Thanks, Kieran. Um, thanks, so how do we engineer, grow and sustain positive work culture that allows us to manage psychosocial injury and to preempt psychosocial injury? Uh, the neuroscience of trust tells us that compassion, curiosity and creativity create opportunities for connection, increasing oxytocin in the brain and driving performance. So the definition of compassion, the recognition of the suffering of others and a desire to alleviate their predicament is distinct from the definition for empathy, empathy which lacks the element of action or the drive to do something to assist others out of their suffering. Curiosity is a state of aroused, increased arousal response promoted by a stimulus high in uncertainty and lacking in information. Creativity can be described as use of the imagination or original ideas to solve problems, communicate with others and entertain ourselves. Creativity is ideas turned into outcomes. So how do these fluffy sounding beasts fit into the stable of workplace and how can we put them to good use in the prevention of psychosocial injury? Compassion, suffering together. What does a compassionate workplace look and feel like? Employees are more likely to be engaged, dedicated and loyal and cultivate positive interpersonal relationships. Individuals work for the benefit of the whole organisation and not just for salary or personal gain. Motivation to achieve organisational targets increases in proportion to genuine engagement. So the benefits are increased employee retention, stress reduction, increased availability, physical well-being, and stronger interpersonal bonds leading to more positive team dynamics. Positivepsychology.com actually has quite a lot of information about these benefits if you want to have a look at the link provided on the slide. So how do we put compassion into action? A Seattle wealth management firm, Brighton Jones, created a unique position Director of Compassion. The successful candidate's full-time role is to strengthen relationships in the workplace, driving productivity and staff engagement. How do we prioritise compassion as a value? Choosing it as a value in our workplace can feed into refining codes of conduct, 
and amending rules for flexibility when employees are struggling. Champion kindness and encouragement and add compassion as a standing agenda item to regular meetings, feedback and group projects. Compassion starts with the self. Encourage discussion about self-compassion. Train leaders in, in compassionate behaviour. There's a Harvard Business Review compassion test that you can take to see how you rate in that regard. Non-judgmental, authentic conversations lead us to more robust exchanges. You can put more of yourself in there. Compassion leads to clarity. It's inevitably easier to have difficult conversations at work when our relationships are based on respect. The philosopher and early psychologist William James described curiosity as the impulse towards better cognition. The psychology and neuroscience of curiosity explores drivers for curiosity and found that in problem solving situations, people are more likely to be curious where they have a degree of familiarity with the subject matter and just enough information to pique their interest. Curiosity is described as the wick in the candle of learning, activating reward circuitry in the brain and enhancing memory. Curiosity leads to creativity and competence. Employees working in highly structured environments such as call centres who showed higher curiosity levels are more likely to seek information from a wide number of colleagues, leading them to build a flexible skill set with better creative problem solving to address client concerns. Curiosity leads to less errors. When we work as curious teams or curious individuals, we are less likely to default, default to confirmation bias, i.e looking for information that supports our beliefs. Curiosity is inclusive. Inclusivity is a byproduct of curiosity, enabling people to speak up and contribute. Curiosity creates resilience to change. Curiosity creates an environment where change is both anticipated and welcomed, creating a growth mindset. So how do we grow curiosity in the workplace? 70% of Australian workers surveyed in a Queensland survey said that they hesitated to ask questions at work. So consider how your workplace regards curiosity. Is it considered to be inefficient and risky or an opportunity for change? Hire for curiosity. Ask questions at interview that require candidates to demonstrate their curiosity. Be genuinely curious in your own interactions. Model curiosity at every interaction. Ask open questions. Be inquisitive and comfortable with being challenged. People like us more and contrary to popular belief, see us as competent when we ask questions. Value research and reflection. Focus on learning goals rather than performance goals. Make learning the goal. A body of research demonstrates that framing work around learning goals, developing competence, acquiring skills, mastering new situations and so on, rather than performance goals of hitting targets, proving our competence, impressing others, boosts motivation. And when motivated by learning goals, we acquire more diverse skills and do better at work. Create opportunities and time for employees to broaden their interests. Training and education in any field encourages cross-pollination of approaches. Allocation of time to pursue further study, even in an unrelated area, leads to deeper engagement with work and at work. Pose curious questions. Behavioural scientist Francesco Gina conducted a study with 200 employees across various industries. Twice a week for four and a half weeks, employees received a morning text asking them to identify one topic or issue that they were curious about, to ask about one thing they usually take for granted, and to ask some why questions in the course of their day. After four weeks, they were evaluated and scored highly on contributing to constructive solutions to organisational problems. Creativity is intelligence having fun. Research around the six attributes of positive and healthy workplace culture includes creativity as a foundational element. Behaviours aligned with values are the most powerful determinants for change. 
Is creativity one of the values of your workplace? Creativity sets us up to solve complex problems that benefit policies, products and productivity and service delivery. Risk averse attitudes to innovation limit creativity and impact negatively on people's sense of empowerment. So how do we implement creativity in the workplace? Set the stage for brainstorming. Create opportunities for ideas to be explored. Don't evaluate too quickly and don't settle for just one option. Allocate time in the work schedule for people to work on projects. Not all productive brainstorming takes place in team meetings. Consider giving space to people to work alone or in small groups. Encourage individuality. Embrace individuality in terms of personal diversity and also the need to work independently. Not all creative concepts come from group work. Some people prefer to work solo on aspects of a project. Make space for this and allow individuals to take carriage of projects rather than defaulting to the team leader. Provide a stimulating atmosphere. Changing routines or providing a different space to work out ideas in can lead to innovation. Try holding a meeting outside. Facilitate anonymous suggestions. Having a suggestion box to address and implement suggestions is a practical suggestion. People will stop contributing if the ideas are not acknowledged, so there needs to be a mechanism to actually respond to those ideas. Act on and acknowledge good ideas at all times. Respond to and acknowledge where ideas have come from, even when they land in a different project. Diverse teams cross-pollinate. Look for diversity in teams and leadership. Difference in personal and functional presentation leads to greater creativity. So just to summarise, psychosocial hazards are the parts of the work that we do that can cause harm to our mental health and well-being, as Kieran has put forward. A positive work culture reduces psychosocial hazards, helps employees thrive and shapes the reputation and the potential of an organisation. Compassion, curiosity and creativity are important aspects of positive work culture that can be cultivated in any organisation. And just to say that we could have chosen any number of um, ways to look at positive work culture, but in our own experience, these three elements, compassion, curiosity and creativity, are great drivers of change and sustained well-being in the workplace. For further information, um, as Kieran mentioned before, we've put some links here to organisations that have helpful evaluative and information um, sites. So Thrive at Work have a toolkit that can be used by organisations to evaluate their current mental health practices and develop a mental health and wellbeing strategy and action plan. It's a great practical resource. Safe Work Australia also have a useful article on how employers can meet their duties in relation to work-related psychological health and safety. Work-related psychological health and safety, a systematic approach to meeting your duties. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Right, so um, thank you, Kieran and Valerie. So we will now uh, answer any audience questions uh, that um, that are coming through. So earlier, uh, Kieran and Valerie, a comment uh, came through saying direct vicarious and cumulative trauma amongst correction staff. I'm not sure if you want to make any comment in relation to that. Mm, definitely, I think that's that's a really important point. So I think that's a really good example of um, a, a significant issue that a lot of correctional staff would um, would face. Um, I, I think I, I really just gave a few um, broad examples. I think I mentioned um, medical and legal settings, but kind of um, it's it's there's. I think the more you kind of uh, sort of look into it, you find that there's vicarious trauma experienced by people in just a range of different industries. Um, so. I guess if you're thinking about um, like hospital settings, um, but also um, like private kind of healthcare settings, 
um, as well as um, yeah, a whole range of legal settings. Um, for example, professional officers um, might be uh, people in um, security um, positions as well. But yeah, there's a whole range. I think that's a really, um, really good point. You know, All right, thank you, Kieran. A question, how do you affect the culture from lower levels? How do you impress the importance of the three C's upwards to leadership? So in terms of that question, I guess I need to understand a little bit more about what's being asked there. Is it that say uh, a manager is looking to um, to embed that in the culture from within a, a team? rather than it being driven from above, from the higher level of management? Or is it individuals in a team? I, a comment has come through and I believe it's uh, connected. So it was mentioned that uh, including curiosity into the interview process is beneficial. Mm -hmm. um, do you have an example or provide insight into how to best implement this into the interview? Yeah, so depending on the industry that you work in, in, in the industry that we work in, then we were, would provide a fairly complex scenario with a number of elements in there um, that we will ask the person to problem solve in the interview. And we've found that that gives us a really good indicator, not only of that person's skills, but the kind of questions that they ask around what they may not know in that situation, which gives a great indication of their drive to actually understand more about the role. All right, thanks Valerie. Another question, what about when allowing people to be creative comes at the expense of other employees? Sometimes spending time on being creative can affect other employees negatively and don't get the job done. Hmm. I think like anything, um, there needs to be a balance in those matters and I don't think that um, perhaps one person uh, being given time and space to work on a particular project in a creative way is going to uh, create harmony within a team or productivity. So it's something where inclusivity is really important there. So for example if you have a project that you're, work, that you're working on that you identify clear, clearly the areas that people will contribute to so that others aren't left out. And creativity is not just ideas. Creativity um, is only creativity when it translates into action and an outcome. So there need to be timelines and there need to be a clear indication of how people will work within those. All right, thanks Valerie. Another question, how would you go about shifting to a positive work culture? How do you start? How would you move forward when management disagree? Mm. That's the eternal question, isn't it? Um, and as a workplace mediator, I often have that question posed to me. And I think that change happens in small steps. So I, I think one of the dangers is to just keep on doing what you're doing. I think that people are led by their values and values translate into behaviour and into action. So if you feel that uh, management are not agreeing, it may be that you're not being heard. So I think it's really important to actually draw a space to set your, your voice forward in terms of your values and how that translates into um, action in the workplace and how that will translate into better outcomes. Often leadership are interested in outcomes and so if you can pose it from that perspective as well as one of the elements of change then I think that you can't fail to be successful there but it does take time and it is a team effort. I guess it'll also I might just add that um, kind of like I was talking about earlier about the return on investment sometimes drawing attention to management about those um, kind of financial benefits and mm. just in the general impact on organisations in a positive way investment in a positive work culture um, could go a really, really long way um, to, to sort of um, helping push that yeah. through. I think that's good to have that research and I think you said two dollars, was it two dollars thirty for every for every dollar invested um, was the was the out financial outcome. All right, thank you Kieran and Valerie. Another question, how would you feel how would you feel would be the best way as an employee 
would to, would be to approach management to implement more of these ideas in the workplace for a better workplace culture. Okay. Um, I think it's really important to start with um, drawing the team together so that you're not a lone voice within your team. So again, to come back to values, leading behaviour, so that you, along with your teams, come up with the way that you would like to have input into the organisation as a whole and how that you think that will benefit everybody in the broader sense. So I think you have to organise your ideas draw your colleagues together and put forward how that will translate into outcomes um, and also what you expect from or anticipate or hope for from management in order to come alongside uh, their, their values and their goals as well. There are some uh, processes and actually I think in the links um, one of the resources that we gave that has given uh, some a good six step process to looking at work culture um, and improving work culture. Um, so Safe Work Australia has um, some really useful um, information on this kind of topic. Um, so they've actually got a, um, um, a model a code of practice for um, managing risks to health and safety. Um, so more from a, a manager's kind of um, perspective. Um, so that's, that's available um, on the Safe Work um, Australia website might be useful um, to answer that question. Um, and they have some you know, general information about risk management processes as well. So identifying hazards, assessing risks, controlling them, and reviewing control procedures, but um, in a lot more detail. Um, and um, yeah, so that, that might be a useful kind of resource to, to look into if you're interested in further information. Thank you, Kieran and Valerie. Question, in an environment where work is quite repetitive in nature, how can we achieve the three C's? Do you have any advice, please? Yes, I think that's a great question because when I was thinking about the reality of this for some workplaces where that's the case, I looked in some res into some research around call centres and how they're operated because they're a great example where there are high pressures uh, and a very repetitive and structured environment. Um, so, Again, that was about looking at interview uh, if you, from an employee's, employer's perspective about identifying attributes of curiosity. But they didn't mention creativity and compassion, but there's no reason why you couldn't work those into the workplace culture if that's something that you wanted to be a driver. It might also be looking at productivity over time with those because people aren't necessarily more productive in those environments. They tend to be, according to the research, more productive when they've actually been given an opportunity to take more breaks or to look at better ways of engineering the work environment. So I think it is about making space within those team environments, not just about um, hitting targets, but about how do we do this in a more efficient way? I hope that answers the question. Thank you, Valerie. A question, uh, what, is the res what is the research that this methodology discussed today is based on? In terms of creativity and compassion and curiosity, it's drawn from various um, parts of research. Um, but I think it, it was more in terms of reflecting on what we see coming into in the EAS, EAP space, the Employee Assistance Program space, in, in terms of uh, the kind of conflict that we see within workplaces with people looking for ways uh, where methodologies maybe have let them down to actually refresh the workplace and try to find ways to engineer healthier workspaces. Thank you, Valerie. Another question. Suppose managers and leadership don't display qualities that have been mentioned. How do you influence upwards and change the culture from a low level position? Hmm. I've certainly had that experience myself. Do you want to speak to that at all, Karen? Um, 
I think I'm okay. <laughs> so in my personal experience, it's been to put that and request for that to be a standing agenda item on team meetings so that it's something that doesn't go away because we're often at a low level asked to contribute to team meetings and you can either take that as an opportunity to sit there and think about what you're going to do during the day or you can genuinely say there's part of this work culture that I would like to look at and I would like to see happen differently or to manufacture differently. Um, and I found that that's a really good space to start because those are minuted and there's an expectation that they will be actioned. Uh, and I feel that that kind of positivity breeds on itself. And I've seen great success in putting uh, not just the three C's, but other um, aspects of practice or values on the work agenda. And then that becomes either a weekly or a monthly revisiting of those and how they've been implemented. And generally those uh, can be um, fed up to management um, as an example of what people are actually looking for. And I've had success in moving across different teams in an organisation to actually seek information about other people being interested in those uh, particular qualities and found that they're actually quite um, uh, catchy. You know, people are interested in, in those as leading values. And I think because it's a different approach, we're not talking necessarily about just specific work skills but those being the values of the organisation, I find that people find those uh, quite compelling um, and are willing to actually contribute to them when they understand how they might go into different work practice. I think um, also just to add to that, um, if somebody feels uncomfortable about um, sort of bringing up issues like that mm. in an you know, agenda or in a team meeting, um, it might be um, for, for that person really um, trying to think about who they can approach that they feel comfortable with in the workplace that might have some kind of um, influence or, or um, decision making ability. Um, so, you know, in my personal experience, um, if there's been something I've been a little bit, um, you know, like wanting to see happen maybe or something I'm a little bit concerned about or come across, um, I, I would usually um, personally bring that up with my um, immediate supervisor if I felt that there was a, um, a dynamic where they were open to that. Kind of idea and then it might kind of move a bit further up um, through the organisation from, from there as well. So I think um, both approaches um, can, can definitely be useful. All right, thanks Karen and Valerie. Uh, just to let everyone know as well, we, we have gone over the uh, scheduled half hour um, for this session. Um, however, we will keep uh, keep going. We do have a few more questions to, uh, to get through. Um, so another question, Karen and Valerie, do you have any tips on getting management to adopt the culture described that you acknowledge that it is important in management meetings and, and spruik it in newsletters and team meetings, but revert back to a command and control management, dulling engagement, etc.? Mm. I guess it's about taking responsibility to keep those principles alive. And, and to keep them relevant. And I think that, that there's a little bit of caution around engineering something like that, because it can feel a little bit clunky using those words. So you need to find um, the drivers in your workplace. I also think that listening to what people uh, put forward grievance about is a really good start. So what is it that they're feeling is not working for them? And then actually turning that into suggestions for change. Um, and I mentioned before having a um, suggestion box. So I think a suggestion box is a really good neutral space to start with that. But once if you're within a team and you're interested in, in uh, changing culture, I think once you have a sense of what it is that people want and who the champions are within the team who are actually got the energy and the drive to bring that into being, then you've actually got a really positive team working from within. I also think that management themselves um, do suffer from set and forget. And there's nothing like the, uh, the dullness of coming to work thinking you know exactly what you're going to be doing and you're going to be taking the same approach. I don't think anybody actually wants that for their life. That's my experience of working with managers as well. So I actually think it's about um, perhaps people remembering what's important and bringing that 
to the attention of management is sometimes a bit of a gift. Thank you. Another question, if you're stuck in a workplace with a negative culture, what can you do? Well, I guess we've talked about a few things that you can do. Um, and, and I guess I would ask people to look at what is it about the culture that's negative and how you yourself, when you walk through the door, contribute to that by inaction or by joining in the negative voice, which is a very, very delicious and enticing thing to do when it is a difficult workplace. I think that we have an obligation once our consciousness is raised that things aren't as great as they could be to be the driver of that change. But it does take a little bit of courage to be that person. But I, again, I think it's about being the voice that turns it from grievance into actually opportunity um, and also remaining hopeful that things can change. Because what we see is that if people have tried that and it hasn't succeeded, then they've learned something from it and they generally move on to a workplace where they feel valued or where they feel they can drive those values. Thank you, Valerie. How do we keep a good work culture during the current situation with the pandemic? I think that's a really good question um, and very relevant to, to what's happening at the moment um, for a lot of workers. Um, I think really um, we actually developed a bit of a fact sheet on this, um, this kind of idea, a bit of a resource for the idea of working from home and how it can really impact our, our mental health as well and just our overall feelings of um, you know, positivity, I guess. Um, so I think um, one of the things to really consider is that idea of being able to kind of keep in touch with our, our colleagues and our supervisors um, remotely, um, whether that's you know, via phone or through um, like a video chat mm -hmm. kind of feature. Um, it might be about actually checking in a little bit more regularly. Um, so if, for instance, you had previously had a supervision session once every um, two weeks or a month, it might actually be about having a little bit more, um, uh, sorry, a bit, a bit less time between those sessions. Um, so there's a bit more frequent, um, I guess, contact. Um, so I think that's probably a, a good place to start. Um, but also, I guess, ideas around um, just making sure that we look after our, our own wellbeing um, while we're working from home or working remotely. Um, so it might be about making sure we, um, you know, we look after our lifestyle, that we um, have a bit of a balance in the things that we um, that we do, that we're not um, overworking, that we're we're kind of got a bit of a, a schedule or even some alarm set to be able to um, help us um, kind of move from work to a home environment at the end of the day. Um, so yeah, I think a few things like that can go really really long way. Um, but definitely, I, I think really that importance of um, connection with um, colleagues and keeping in touch with them, um, just in a different kind of way to how we. Um, might have um, before in, in an office space. I think too that there oh. were, um, you know, the Tasmanian experience has been a little bit different, um, but certainly there were people who benefited from working from home and there were some positives in that as well. Stephanie, back to you. Yes, uh, thank you, Kieran and Valerie. What is the flip side of the ROI? How much would it hinder if the money isn't utilised? Oh, that's a really good question. Mm. Um, I don't really have the answer to that. I think um, if you'd be looking at some statistics, I would suggest um, probably going to um, headsup.org.au um, um, and they've got a lot of really interesting information on that. Um, there's also um, Thrive at Work have a, um, a survey that um, has a lot of really interesting um, information. Let's see if I can find the, um, so it's called the Ind Indicators of a Thriving Workplace Survey. Um, so it's a, a national report from 2018 um, and yeah, that might be a useful thing to, to look into as well. All right, thank you. A question, what words or topics would you add to a monthly meeting agenda? I think it really depends on what you, what you actually want to change, what's missing there. Um, so I know that in some of the research that I did that compassion was put on the agenda um, once people had a familiarity with that word and realised that it was a word of action not something kind of uh, remote and benevolent um, so it could be a good start there. Um, I think curiosity is a great thing to put on your workplace agenda because it 
actually asks you then to engage. What is it that you're curious about? What is it that you want to, to add to in the workplace? What is it that you want to change? And I, I think I'm a great person for doing polls in the workplace. What are the things that people would like to see go on, on the agenda? So perhaps you can cre create a bit of a survey in your workplace to see what's missing there. I also think it's a All great right. idea in, in meetings to share the load so that people get to contribute to those ideas rather than one person being the holder of the, the agenda. Thank you, Valerie. Another question. What about when you know what you want culturally, but not how to get there? And when you suggest it to management, they ask you to go away and make suggestions on how to achieve it. Hmm. I think if you know what you want, then it has to be something that has included the capacity uh, that your team has or that you then need to grow that capacity within the team. So I think that those are two different things to ref reflect on. If you are looking to grow a culture of uh, engagement or positivity, then obviously you need to model that and you need management to model that as well. So there needs to be a good bridge between those two, those two spheres of management. I think that it is about uh, incrementally increasing that, but it's also engaging the team in how that would look if you want to implement a new idea or you want to change work culture. But ultimately it starts with the person with that idea and then recruiting some, some mentors or some champions within the team. Thank you, Valerie. Are there any uh, tips for a workplace where staff have given up on making suggestions as they know that no change will come from it? I think the tips for that would go to management. What is it that benefits the workplace to have a team that stops asking questions? What's your level of presenteeism like? Um, because people will disengage if they're not stimulated. Um, and then we end up with a culture where people are seen as, as lazy or dead wood or doing the minimum. So I think as, as managers, uh, as in people in positions of leadership, we've actually got a moral obligation to engage pe with people on a daily level to make sure that they are feeling heard, that they're feeling valued, that they feel that their work has actual meaning. I, that Thank cannot you, be changed. Yeah. Thank you. And we have uh, one final question. Are there any management courses that help with these issues within the workplace and strategies to implement within the workplace? That's a really good question. Uh, I know that there will be. Um, and I'm aware that, um, for example, Amma Vita has uh, a management course that's pretty minimally um, able to be attended. So it's it's about um, neurological, uh, sorry, I'm forgetting my words here, um, the neuroscience of leadership. And I think that that's a really good one to start with because it actually looks at what, how do we make change and what's happening in the brain when we do that and how do we lead through our awareness. Um, and I, it's quite a creative approach, but I think that there are many, many others and, and, I'll, and I'd be happy to go and look at some more. Did you have any to add to that? I don't think any specifically, uh, mm. uh, but I'm sure there must be, um, must be some out there. Yeah. Um, okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, so that brings us to the end of today's webinar. Thank you, Dr. Kieran Holm and Valerie Matsumoto, both from Positive Solutions. And thank you everyone for attending today's webinar, Better Safe, Building a High Trust Culture in the Workplace. At the close of today's webinar, you will receive a survey. We do appreciate you providing us with your feedback. Today's webinar has also been recorded and will be made available on WorkSafe Tasmania's YouTube page. Finally, to find out more about Tasmania's WorkSafe Month and other services funded by the WorkCover Tasmania Board, delivered by WorkSafe Tasmania, please head to the WorkSafe Tasmania website. And on behalf of WorkSafe Tasmania and the WorkCover Tasmania Board, thank you for joining us.